it is now time to welcome our main keynote speaker uh, of tonight. I propose to warmly welcome uh, Hugues Berzini, professor at ULB and co-director of the Eruidia Lab of the ULB, a specialist, big specialist of the artificial intelligence. Thank you, professor, to have accepted to be our main speaker tonight. You're welcome. Um, and the floor is yours. So. Um, the first uh, five, ten minutes would be to uh, uh, explain why this hype for this field. Uh, and uh, basically, scientifically, I would say that you may have heard a lot about deep learning, machine learning, big data, this kind of stuff. And uh, I guess that one key reason why AI has become so popular is because uh, there is a growing gap between two traditions of AI. And uh, I am a fan of one first tradition, which is now called the Go5, a good old-fashioned AI. And as you know, this new tradition of AI is taking the lead right now, this deep learning, machine learning, in AI. and I'll try to very rapidly differentiate those two AI in five minutes. So, and, and I usually call those two AIs conscious and subconscious, and I, and I will help you to understand what I mean by that. But the, the gap is growing a lot between those two AIs, and more than that, the second AI, the one which is highly successful this last five, six years, what I usually call the subconscious AI, is really invading the field of the first AI, the, the, the good old-fashioned AI. So this is what really impressed me. And you can do a lot with this subconscious AI, and I'll try to show you a very small example of what is the difference between the two AIs and why the second one is so successful. But more interesting for you would be to, uh, perhaps, you know, I'm in this field for so long that I have, uh, have a lot of interaction with companies, big companies, medium one, small one, and uh, I've developed some kind of experience, you know, like the Viosage of uh, perhaps good recommendations when you want to create your startup or you want to, uh, uh, you know, interact with uh, big guys and uh, doing AI. So I can, I'll try to convey some recommendations, some advices, if you allow myself modestly, about, uh, you know, my success and failures in doing AIs with startup. I think had, I accompany the creation of something like 10 or 11 startups, you know, my whole career. So Vadis was, in fact, uh, one of them. And uh, I'm, I'm keep interacting with startups with Quantify these last uh, years. And uh, so perhaps you hear about mentees and uh, others, etc. So some of them succeed and doing pretty well. Some of them fail, normal life. And uh, I, I'll try to give you some advice, perhaps, or some, you know, what I've learned from those interactions. And um, well, first, the uh, distinction between the two AI. This is kind of success of you know, AI this last uh, five, six years. You might recognize all those successes. And you, you think about those uh, tasks, you may agree that they not all manifest the same kind of cognitive abilities for human doing those tasks. In fact, driving a car is not the same as playing Go or playing chess. Uh, you get the feeling that it's not the same kind of cognitive processes that you express when you play chess or when you drive a car. In fact, driving a car is much more unconscious than playing chess. And AI from the very start was interesting in all the facets of our cognitive abilities. This is not an AI slide, this is a psychological slide. When psychologists explain intelligence, they try to differentiate many facets of our intelligence. You know, for instance, uh, the visual spatial intelligence, which is a certain form of intelligence, the linguistic ability, uh, the logical math, and you would agree that when you do logics and math, you're not manifesting the same kind of intelligence that when you perceive or when you just move or when you're emotion or the kind of also emotional intelligence. What is interesting is perhaps most of those tasks, you know, those, if you look at this circle, I think the most important part of those cognitive tasks are being processed even in ourselves in a subconscious way, in an unconscious way. So that explains in part why the subconscious AI, you know, the machine learning, neural network, deep learning AI, is so successful because it succeeds to invade a large part or it succeeds to substitute a large part of our cognitive processes, you know, the one that we manifest in a subconscious way. But what is even more impressed is that even the one that we manifest consciously tends to be replaced more and more by some kind of unconscious machine. And this is what really, you know, triggered me a lot in this evolution of AI. So, Rapidly to differentiate the two AI, I always use the same example. It's a very elementary one, and I will just give you one example. I could have given you many examples, but this is my, still my favorite one, is playing tic-tac-toe. And uh, you can all understand, because I don't have to explain tic-tac-toe, this is the good things of this game, you know. And you have two ways of playing tic-tac-toe. This is the one I'm, I'm teaching for 30 years, called uh, Min Max. 
It's a very famous AI algorithm invented by John van Neumann, who is one of the pioneers of AI, you may know. And uh, well, what is important in this min-max <coughs> is that you play, you see what your opponent is going to do, you see what you do, your opponent is going to do, and at the end, you have a configuration of the game, and then you need a human expertise. And that human expertise gives a score, you know, and that score is something that we know about what are your chances of success when you have reached this configuration. So you need what is called a heuristics. And why did you need a heuristic back in time? Because the machine is not powerful enough to discover everything by itself. So the machine needs to be helped by a human guy who would say, oh, this sounds as a very promising move. Go in that direction. That was the role played by heuristics. No, you can play tic-tac-toe in a fully different way. You could just generate random games and you can compile statistically the winning games and the losing games. In both cases, you will discover the same thing, that the best first move when you play tic-tac-toe is to put, if suppose you are learning to play the cross, is to put the cross in the middle. But you will discover that, but two completely different type of AI. The first one is, you know, conscious reasoning, a little bit like, you know, you do play when you play chess or you play Go. And the other one is fully, to some extent, based on machine learning, game compilation. And you may know that this is, the AI that succeeded after four, five, six years, I don't know how much. I used to try to build software to play Go back in the 80s, because Go was already popular in the 80s, but we were not succeeding with the classical AI. And the final AI who succeeded to defeat the best Go players in the world was this subconscious AI. It learned by itself what were the best moves. That was totally impossible 30 years ago, because we didn't have the power of the machine in order to play statistically all those random games. But that created also a big mess. We won the go, machine won the go, but won the go in a way that is completely understandable, so completely meaningless for even the best go player in the world. So people have questioned Lee Sedol when he was defeated, and Lee Sedol said, okay, I've been defeated by the machine, but more of, moreover, even worse, I didn't understand the way the machine was playing. So the machine rediscovered way of playing Go that hasn't been even invented, even found, even discovered by Lee Seidel himself and many players of Go. So you need to know that these two AIs have always existed. And this is slides extracted from the first AI conference in 56, the famous Dartmouth conference. This is a conference that gave rise to this artificial intelligence thing. The, the name was invented in 56 in the United States. And this is pioneers of AI, and there were people showing your network, even multi-layer your network, so CD learning your network, very old stories. And, uh, and, uh, and they were showing the two traditions. There was another guy showing uh, called Arthur Samuel, and he explained how you can play checker by reinforcement learning. Exactly the same idea than the Go machine right now, called the Alpha Zero or Alpha Go, whatever you need. So those two traditions, they've always existed. But as you may know, the tradition, the conscious AI has won the game for a lot of years. You know, we got the feeling that in order to build intelligent machines, we need to replicate the kind of intelligent processes we have in mind. It seems that no more. Even the subconscious, and I'm gonna show more of examples, seems to be able to even replace the conscious way of doing AI. So, and one of the most famous unconscious way of doing AI is obviously this famous deep learning that you heard a lot, which is just a resurrection of multi-layer neural network. Nothing else. Yann Lequin invented convolutional neural network in 82. So, you know, when I heard about AI revolution, I'm a bit surprised because all the good ideas of AI came back to the 80s or even the 50s because the first neural network was invented, not even in the 50s, in the 40s by uh, Mac Culloch and Pitts. But what happened with this deep learning is that you still, when we were doing your network, and there are people here that I know that are expert in image recognition, the feature extraction, the feature engineering was still done by human. We got the feeling that we need to help the machine, exactly like in the case of Go. We needed to help the machine to be able to perform because we needed to help it to find the right classification, the right classification. But since this last five, six years, we realize that we, the machine doesn't even need our help. They can find by themselves what are the good features to do the classification. What makes a cat a cat, what makes a dog a dog can be discovered by the machine itself. We don't even need to find the contour, find the contrast between the cat and the dog. The machine will discover it by itself. So, and this is what gives rise to this incredible success of this subconscious AI, like the automated legendary 
uh, of the images. So keep in mind that there is a mystification of AI. When you see a picture, this is something I want, I need important, I think important to remind to all of you. When you, you do recognize a picture, when you see a picture of a man playing a guitar and you say that in this picture there is a man playing a guitar, you know what is a man, you know what it is playing a guitar, you already heard a guitar. You, and the, this is a big difference with the machine. The machine can do exactly the same thing as you. The machine as you can tell this is a man playing a guitar, but there's a huge difference. The machine has no clue of what is a man, or what is hearing a guitar, what is playing a guitar. Keep that in mind. This is really important. There is a mystification of AI too. So, do you know who is he? Yeah, it's me. Great. It's his famous face up. I received this sent by my son. You know, my son is very kind. And he, he, he sent me, you know, this is what you're going to become in the 20 years. I was kind of afraid, you know. But, you know, I'm not, I was not afraid that that was me. I'm afraid that that was really like my mom. It's really like my mom. It works, this, this, this incredible thing. I, you know, I thought that it was sending something about my mom. So, what, I mean, this face up, which is only based on deep learning, has learned what it means to grow old. But I've learned this in a fully subconscious way, you know, by just using deep learning. It's just very impressive. I have no problem to say that it is impressive. I have just one problem. Where is the science? I've, I've written a Tribune in the Monde because I was a little bit upset by a book by Yann Lequin, which, by the way, is a friend of mine. So I, I'm, 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 I'm certainly a great guy. He's one of the guys who received the Turing Prize for invented the deep learning. But they say, this is a revolution. And I say, well, where, where is the revolution? You know, I don't see any revolution in that. You know, your network is such an old idea. But I even see a regression in the science of AI. There was definitely a very interesting progression in the technology but we don't understand any longer. You know, we can make some, we, we, to some extent, we imitate the growing old, but there is no science. We, we, we've lost the science of what means growing old, or we've lost the science of linguistic translation. You know, I was surprised when Google say, we've made incredible progress in translation the, the, the day we fired all the linguists in our lab. This is pretty frightening, you know. Without the linguist, without the science of linguistic, they could achieve such an incredible and successful thing. So this is what happened a little bit over here. So keep in mind that all AI is not a love affair between big data and machine learning. There was a previous AI, and I would like to show you that this previous AI is still very successful and can still help you a lot. When you come here and use your GPS, you use Waze or Google Maps, it's not at all machine learning. Might be big data, obviously, it was big data because you have a cartography, so you need those data. But it is not machine learning. And the good old fashioned AI is still very useful. In fact, I'm trying to help a startup these days to do, uh, perhaps you heard about that, and I'm going to jump on that, is um, an application called Join Join. We hear talk by some uh, uh, political representative of Brussels. And um, I, I'm trying to do that for Brussels. As you know, uh, mobility in Brussels is certainly one of the mission of the government is a chaos. It's more and more chaotic. And uh, it's not the will of politicians, it's not even the will of the actors of mobility, the one that provide the bike, the car sharing, the horse sharing. I don't know what you can share still, but there are so many things that can help for mobility. The problem is coordination of those things. And we create an app, and uh, this is technology we use. And that is the final app that normally should be on the market in January. I would like to say something for Innoviris. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy that Innoviris exists. In fact, they finance this, this uh, GZ thing. So GZ is an app that will find a solution for you where you can mix the modalities. So you can take the tram, you can use the bike. And, and, and this is a very difficult optimization process because we have, oh, excuse me, this is not what I wanted to show. You have to surf among different modalities, and every modality is a graph. So we do short path, shortest path in many graphs, and we also learn to go from graph to graph. So take the bike, take the horse, any modalities as its own graph. And at the end, we provide that kind of solution. And we want to respect the planet. So one of those solutions would be good for the planet. If you don't want to respect the planet, you can find solution which is good for your wallet or good for your time. So you can select among different objectives. So, I mean, Innoviris is helping us. I would like to say something to Innoviris, which is a kind thing. I, I think it's great that Innoviris exists. The only thing I would complain against Innoviris is that they should be agile. I'm teaching agility for 30 years uh, uh, in computer scientist. You, agility means you give money fast enough, you don't wait years for investing, 
You know, once you see something interesting, you straightforwardly give the money, and you don't give money for three years. You give money for two months, for three months, and then you see the people arriving. You also invite the clients, so the people, the, normally the academic of a company are doing the software for. You see how they interact, you see how successful they are, and you also be sure that they have developers, and they have the right developers. You need to be able to assess the quality of the developers in the project of finance. So agility is a key word in our computer world. I know that Brussels government is not very agile, and even the whole politic in Belgium is not very agile, but if you want to finance software, if you want to finance that, you need to be much more agile. That's just a message for them. I, I was telling you that I wanted to deliver some message. So uh, another very nice application is Watson. I'm a very fan of Watson. I believe that Watson is certainly one of the most successful things that AI has done. You know Watson, so this is the famous software that defeated um, uh, at this famous game, uh, Jeopardy, which is uh, similar to uh, uh, Question pour un champion. When you speak about Jeopardy, no one knows, but Question pour un champion, I guess perhaps the oldest one in the room have uh, seen that at the TV. And it's incredible that a machine can achieve this, you know, be able to answer faster than human being to any kind of question. And it's interesting to know that 95% of the answers of Watson in the game Jeopardy are first pages of Wikipedia. And so Watson is an interesting tool because it has nothing to do again with machine learning and deep learning. There is not a gram of deep learning in Watson. So you can do still a very good amount of AI without deep learning. I keep telling that because anytime, you know, when I'm going in meeting, people tell me, oh, you are an AI guy, so you're deep learning. Uh, no, no, I'm not deep learning. Deep learning is not synonymous with AI. It's never been, it will never be. Uh, Watson is doing an incredible thing, but just using natural language processing, uncertainty processing, uh, obviously processing a huge database, which is Wikipedia. And one of the deliver of Watson is Watson Oncology. Just an, another message, you know, uh, IBM has developed this thing. I believe that the big actors like IBM, etc., should finance us, the university, in order to understand these tools and perhaps to help companies to adopt those tools because they sell those tools pretty expensively, and I believe that they should deliver these tools in a free way to university and academic. They do it to some extent, but they should also pay researchers in the university in order to use those tools to make them understandable and perhaps to convince them, the companies, that these tools should be used and in, what, in which way, etc. So they try to bypass academy and uh, they should finance us, IBM or Google and these kind of actors. So no, I'm gonna show you some success we had um, we tried to create a, a, a startup, it was uh, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, we wanted to compile all the genome of the planet. The startup was, uh, some here might remember that, it was called In Silico, then Gene Plaza. And um, we had a big competitor, and uh, the big competitor was Google. Uh, and it's Google everywhere. Every, every time you have a good idea and you want to do something, Google is a competitor. It's also a competitor for mobility because we have Waze, we have Google Map. So it's the reason why we need support. Uh, uh, I mean, mobility is definitely a public good. Like you were mentioning, you want to make Brussels a smart city. You want to help energy transition in Brussels. You want to help mobility. Give the money to the academy to do so. And uh, I'll be, you know, we're about to create an AI institute for common good. Perhaps you heard about that. It's a common adventure between VUB and ULB. And we are in this institute for two years. Still expect to be a bit financed. But the public good is definitely a mobility problem. And uh, for mobility, we need a public administration. We had exactly the same problem here. We want to create a repertoire of genomes. We created a big data infrastructure. This is another lesson I'd like to deliver to the people here. Use private big data or use the big data that university can supply you with. Don't use, excuse me, but if you do medicine of you, avoid to use Microsoft or Google Map or, or Amazon Web Service. A lot of university know these days, even at the ULB, we have a big data infrastructure and we'll be very happy to provide the big data services. We have everything inside. We have uh, whatever you want, uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Cassandra, HBase, Park, and we know how to use that. So again, uh, so there was an interesting uh, article in Le Monde, I think it was one week ago, there is a debate in France because all the healthcare service in France want to put their data in the Microsoft cloud. And there is a lot of protest, and I can understand those opposition, you know, because 
can imagine Microsoft being the master of all the health data of everything happening in France. Uh, I think it's kind of, I, I can understand this opposition. So, I mean, in Brussels, we also have interesting big data infrastructure. Please, if you do, med if you have medical application, use ours, and we also can do machine learning and kind of things like that. So, we had this, and it, we failed, and I will try to understand, uh, explain you later why I do believe that we failed. Well, one of the reasons we failed is the quality of the developers. I mean, developers are so important, but not only developers, good developers, you know. This is the reason why when you invest in a project, try to be sure that you have very high-skilled developers. It's a key skill. Even if you have today libraries with huge amount of tools that are prepared, like the deep learning, TensorFlow, whatever, GitHub, a good developer still make a difference. A good developer substitute easily 10 bad developers, you know. It makes the whole difference to have a high skill developer. All my successful projects rely on one or two excellent developers. That is a really key thing. It's not, it's not easy to assess what is an excellent developer. I don't even pretend to be one, but I pretend to be able to recognize some. So, this is another adventure we had with a, a big company called Procter & Gamble. We are interacting with Procter for two years now. And we provide them with a lot of tools. And uh, in that case, it is um, a messaging uh, handling uh, automatic, in an automatic way. So for instance, for instance, this is messages, you know, uh, Procter & Gamble, they selling Landry's, uh, Gillette, uh, 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 also, how do you call that in English, Le Lange. Uh, Typers, yeah, typers. And, uh, and, and so they keep receiving messages and they want to be able to treat those messages in an automated way. So we do clustering for them. So this is classical natural language processing. It's a bit of machine learning, obviously, because you learn to treat those messages. And uh, this is a, another interesting uh, lesson that I drew. I think the, among the startups that I helped to finance and I helped to, cry, to create, the one that have been the most successful are the one that had as a client a very big company in Belgium. So for instance, uh, uh, there was one, um, well, I, I remember at the time where Vadis was created, there was the La Générale and Fortis. Uh, we had one created uh, called Mentis, Masterfoot, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna show you another one uh, called Clue Points, which is a very successful one, and we had GSK. So this gives you a kind of safety net. When a young startup has a big company which is able to finance this startup for years and years because they have the money for, this raise up your chance of success, at least for this startup to survive. Most of the startup that didn't have this sure and rich client, in my experience, they all failed. That seems to be a key criterion for a startup to be able to succeed, is to be sure to have as client someone that can be a safety net, you know, keep financing you, keep using your services, etc. And um, we had a, a, a very nice software and uh, 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 for a prediction. And um, this is another interesting thing in AI. Uh, uh, there's a lot of tools today to recommend. This is uh, one of the key uh, use of AI. Uh, you, we try to recommend what next movie you should see, try to recommend what next book you should buy. And, 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 and we developed a, a recommendation algorithms uh, based on recurrent neural network. Uh, with a bit of deep learning too. Uh, no problem to tell that deep learning works. I've just the problem to tell that this is science. And, uh, and it works quite well. And uh, we provide a little addition to that. We uh, uh, improve this technique by not only, taking, not only taking into account the movies you've seen, but also the sequence of the order, the temporal order in which you've seen the movie. So the fact that you've seen first this movie, then this movie, then this movie, then this movie, etc. And then we predict the next movie you're going to see. What is kind of funny in AI is that all recommendation is based on prediction. And this is an evolution of AI, another evolution that I don't like. I mean, prediction is something. Recommendation is a completely different thing. The fact that we recommend what we already predicted, I think, is kind of, you know, kind of uh, frightening because it just opened open door. You, you, you're about to see this movie. Why should I recommend a movie that you're about to see? This is often most of the strategy attitude of those big GAFA because they want you not to miss this movie. So uh, even if you are about to see this movie, I'm going to recommend it to you. And this is a key difference between prediction and recommendation. Prediction is which movie you're about to see, you're likely to see. Recommendation is I'm going to tell you an interesting movie to see. And perhaps it is not at all the one I predict you're going to see. Perhaps it could be something I absolutely believe that you would never see in your life. 
because it's not in your prediction agenda. Or a random movie. So you see that there is a huge difference prediction and recommendation. This happened a lot in AI debate today. I would come on some of the debate today. You may have heard about Compass, which predict that someone will recidivize. Uh, you know, this is a famous algorithm that raised a lot of issues in, uh, in, uh, in law in the United States. You have a deep running these days that is able to predict not so good with a lot of false positive and false negative that someone is about to commit a crime or not. So you should not liberate this, this person, etc. This is prediction. And as a predictor, it works quite well with some mistakes, you know, we can assess the reliability of that. But even if you have this prediction engine, it's a whole of things to recommend or to take a decision based on this prediction. You need to be able to understand, I think in AI is key, uh, the difference between prediction and what you do with this prediction. We used our uh, uh, prediction engine to predict not only movies, but we predict something that happens in your heart quite often, which is called atrial fibrillation. So this is a way your heart tends to be a bit chaotic in time, and more you grow old, more your heart has this problem. And uh, it seems that we are the first, uh, in Europe at least, uh, to be able to predict uh, what is called the uh, fibrial atrialization. And it's again a, an interesting application of deep learning. <coughs> we try to predict what your heart is about to do. And uh, the red is the crisis, and you see that uh, before that, the neural network, uh, 30 seconds before, is able to tell, oh, look at your heart, it is about to fibrillate. And uh, an interesting uh, pacemaker could make a difference and uh, prevent or you know, inhibit this possible fibrillation. So this is another interesting medical application. And we are trying to convince some key players, like for instance GSK, etc., that they could finance that and help us to create perhaps a startup with that. Uh, Default recognition is another interesting thing. We used to do default recognition. This is a, a thing we did 30 years ago, I guess, or 20 years ago for Glaverbell. At the time, Glaverbell was a, a very important glass producer here in Belgium. And they wanted us to be able to differentiate a glass with a default, like the one on my left and the one without default. And uh, we did a lot of feature engineering. Olivier is in the room, he remember that. And, and, uh, and Noah had exactly the same request. We were kind of successful, but with a lot of pre-processing. And Noah had exactly the same request by, again, Proctor. They come to tell me, they came to see me and tell me, you know, we have a problem with our line of production. We, they create a land race. And uh, we'd like to be able to distinguish and to diagnose, or at least to uh, detect leakage in the, the, our line of production. They were doing a lot of feature engineering themselves, you know, and, uh, and they had a success rate of, let's say, 70% of 75%, so 25% distributed in between false positive and false negative. And they came to us and tell us, can you do better? And I have a student who was just a good student, a good developer, but still a student in the last year. I told him, oh, you have a database of pictures. Uh, uh, could you do something with that? He used the deep learning, and he could achieve 95% of accuracy in that same thing. And, and, and that is, and I, and I accept that deep learning is pretty successful. And again, because you don't even have to do any kind of feature engineering, you know. Just by applying the image in a very sophisticated architecture, you could achieve this kind of thing. And Procter & Gamble was pretty surprised. So it's true that in terms of application, it's a very good time for AI, because with those tools, we can do incredible things. And in fact, no, in Procter, they're gonna equip their lines with this uh, deep learning way of, of detecting leakage. And you can imagine that they were throwing away 25% of their production. I know they will save 20% and keep, you know, just throw away 5%. So uh, another very uh, successful, and, and that has uh, a company that is called uh, Clue Points, which is very successful. It's a startup that has been created in the lab uh, 10 years ago. And we had a request by, uh, uh, at the time it was GSK, but also UCB, the big pharma, again, big guys. They have money. They can keep financing you for years. And they come to us and tell us, you know, we have a problem. Uh, we, when, whenever we have to test a pill or a medicine or whatever, we need to send this treatment to many centers in the world, like hundreds of centers. And they do the treatment and they follow the patients and they, they send back reports. And for each report that has been sent back from India, Korea, Vietnam, China, the different countries that were testing this medicine, we have to send audit people in those different centers to see if they've done the job properly, you know, if the centers has not been too lazy or even fraudulent. And so they have to send people, hundreds of people. It's cost a lot of money. And they came to us and asked us, 
could you identify centers that are not doing the job properly? And that would reduce the number of people we have to send in those different places. And uh, we did it. And we used classical outlier detection techniques, statistical, perhaps a statistician in the room uh, 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 knows about the p-values or clustering, all those techniques, and we identify those centers. And I, I'm pretty sure that outlier detection is a very useful tool in AI, but we had GSK, and GSK for, I just know, for five, six years, keep on financing the software development, and they know they can extend and do the same thing about lying detection and fraud detection, whatever, for different uh, type of problems. But we're cool because we still have GSK supporting us, and not only GSK, but also a lot of other big farmers know that GSK, I've seen how successful that can be. And we're doing the same now with a lot of data analysis in IoT. So if you're interested in IoT, I want the IoT to be processed in our big data infrastructure. So we're interacting these days with Degetel, which is, which is a French company uh, doing a lot of IoT and IoT outlying detection. Because as you know, IoT has a lot of safety problems because nothing guarantees the safety of those IoT. So detecting problems in the IoT infrastructure is a very key thing. And so we are right now interacting with Degetel which provide us data from coming from orange or from uh, shape, and uh, we try to apply the same outlier detection problem. Uh, I'm going to jump this one. I'm going to jump this one, too, because I don't have time. And I'd like to uh, reach, jump to, yeah, still have five minutes to jump to the conclusions. So going back to most of the thing I've shown to you was cl classical AI techniques. Have you seen 50% of what I've tried to show you was classical AI? We still need a lot of NLP, uh, graph, rule-based system. Uh, I think it's, they're still very successful. Don't forget to teach, to learn the classical AI too. It's still very useful. And if you think about the Stuart Russell book, which is the Bible in AI, the machine learning part is one, I think it's one-fifth of the book. Might be more important in the next edition, but yet, you know, four-fifths of the book is classical AI. So I still believe that knowledge-based, rule-based, uh, graph search, all those interesting ideas that create the field are useful. And um, there used to be an interesting thing, you know, if you think again about human being, we most of the time are unconscious. Most of the thing we're doing, 95% of the time we're doing it in an unconscious way. We don't think about it. And we're very good at that. But sometimes we have problems. And when we have a problem, you know, the philosopher have a lot to elaborate on that. When we have a problem, we need to become conscious. We need to be able to process what the problem is. We need to find a solution for the problem. And this is where we become intelligent. This is where human intelligence manifests itself. You know, we try to see, okay, so if I, what, what happened? No, I suppose uh, I had a problem with my car for coming here. You know, I was driving my car in a subconscious way to reach here. But if I had a, a breakdown or, a, you know, a, a failure, whatever, with my car, I would have been you know, for, um, forced to think about it, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the subway, this is an alternative, I'm going to use an Uber, I'm going to jump on an Uber jump, and uh, uh, so you, you understand this, you know, this moment where you leave your unconscious, very comfortable domain in order to think and to be rational. So, and in general, you know, that happens when you find yourself in a kind of an unpredictable situation, something that you couldn't expect, you know, something that is not usual, because all the usual things, you've put that in your unconscious cognitive domain. So we keep our rational thinking for the most, you, you know, unusual and unpredictable thing. What's happening in AI these days is a bit the contrary, which is kind of paradoxical evolution. Uh, before, AI was doing the very simple thing with machine consciousness, uh, with machine and consciousness and very complicated thing like playing Go. It was doing it a little bit like we were doing. You know, this simple thing, we can use neural network, and the complicated thing, we're going to use, you know, reasoning, rule-based, etc. But no, it's a little bit different, the contrary that is happening now. AI is invading even the very complex things by means of big data and machine learning. You know, linguistics seems to be complex. <laughs> put it back to a deep learning. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, clearly playing Go. Well, if you, uh, if you had asked, I don't know, John Van Neumann or whatever, the uh, AI pioneers, uh, in order to have a good Go players, would we need some form of human intelligence? Would we need some form of min-max? It would have tell you it's obvious. We couldn't do in a different way. We need human intelligence. We need human engineering. Because this is complex. So we need human engineering. And it was wrong. 
He couldn't imagine at the time that with the power of the machine and the huge amount of data that you can exploit, you don't even need to put intelligence in the software. You know, even a stupid software, subconscious software, can do very intelligent things. So, and um, and this is an evolution that can worry us, you know, because uh, this is a, a, a picture that I've taken from a journal. I don't remember which one, but what, in this picture, they were saying that uh, liberal democracies, so France, Belgium, they're using more and more AI and the unconscious AI to uh, to create mass surveillance. So not only the let's say the autocratic country or the dictator country are using AI for surveillance, even the best and the most democratic country are using AI for surveillance. And perhaps you read the Monde, but this was in, uh, I think it was two weeks ago in the Monde, and uh, there was a, a journalist asking Gérard Darmanin, who was uh, Minister of Finance, uh, uh, isn't a good thing that an AI system uh, uh, <coughs> look at the social networks in order to identify potential fraud. And uh, it was telling, you know, this is what he say. Uh, si vous faites prendre en photo de nombreuses fois avec une voiture de luxe alors que vous n'avez pas les moyens pour le faire, peut-être que c'est votre cousin, votre copine qui vous l'a prêté, peut-être pas. So it was just defending the fact that with those tools, we can identify a pretending poor guy who is driving a Ferrari to get home. And that is possible today with AI because outline detection, picture recognition, facial recognition is becoming so easy. But... You have a lot of problem with that. And this is where I guess European Commission is doing a good job, trying to a little bit respect some basic principle. And that is addressed against deep learning. We can imagine a deep learning doing fraud detection, but if you see the recommendation in Europe, you see that there is two key recommendations, responsibility and transparency. And I guess this is a real problem for this evolution of AI, because this evolution of AI is neither responsible nor transparent. Why so? Because, you know, in order to be accountable of what you do, you need to be able to explain what you've done it. Even if you drove in a subconscious way, once you did an accident and if you've been persecuted for that, you need to explain a little bit what happened before. You need to be able to explain it. And less and less AI is able to explain why it commits an accident, etc. So this is a real issue for the subconscious AI, which is invading all the domain of technology. And um, so, and that is my last slide, and I think I'm perfect in time. Exact. This is my last slide. No, that was my last slide. Yeah, uh, uh, because you know AI is killing people, uh, voluntarily or not, uh, because driving car or uh, driving drone or uh, sending missiles. I guess that the basic things that we need to at least understand, and we need to understand them. We have to self-understand what they're doing. This is why classical AI is still a role to play. But we need to understand what kind of decision they take. And this is a key issue in AI today, you know, explainability. You may have heard about that, but it doesn't mean a lot of thing, you know. Uh, I, I guess it's very important, and Europe is pressing a lot, and I think they're right, to build a system that not only perform, but it's not enough. Even if they do 100%, suppose you have a self-driving car and you have a statistics that they just kill one person while you keep hearing that, while the human drivers keep, you know, 100,000 of persons. But even so, statistically, you would defend the AI because you just kill one person, you know, Tesla killed one person while human drivers. But even so, we need to understand how this person has been killed because it is an AI system. We are much more demanding for AI and we have to be. We need to be much more demanding for an AI system than for human drivers. Human drivers often try to explain why they behave in such a way, and even if this is not a full explanation of what they did, they still have a possibility to try to defend themselves, to explain it. AI these days have not this possibility because the deep learning machine is, not, is completely unable of introspection. You can't explain why it threw the missile or why there was this car accident. And I think this is why I was written this article of the Monde that this was a kind of regression. And just to give you a last example, I think when Lee Seidel was defeated by Alpha Zero, that was a regression for Go. Even if the best player is not a, is not a machine, that was a re regression for Go because defeating Lee Sedol is something. But defeating Lee Sedol is Lee Sedol is impossible to understand why and how he's been defeated is another thing. You know. I believe that we will need time, perhaps, for the Go players to regain control and regain understanding of a, of a game they practice for century, if not millenary, you know. But right now, right now, in this moment for Go, we're living, we're going through a regression. And I think this is an important message also to take home. Thanks for your attention.